Dear friends, today we have a special episode of Super Tony's Adventures. Enjoy! Tony, have you ever thought about what happens to us after we die? No, I'm not going to talk about the light at the end of the tunnel, reincarnation, or heaven. We're going to see how exactly we die and what happens to our bodies in terms of biology. Let's start! The first sign of death, of course, is not having a pulse. But it's not the only one. I don't think you knew that death can be determined by the pupils. If you squeeze the eyeball of a deceased person from the sides, the pupil becomes a narrow slit, like a cat's. And when pressure is applied from above and below, it becomes horizontal. This happens because the pupil is shaped by special muscles that no longer work and cannot return it to its original state. As time passes, death becomes more and more apparent. After about an hour, but sometime sooner, Livor Mortis appears on the body. The heart is no longer working, so the blood no longer circulates. Gravity moves the blood through the vessels downwards. This causes the lower parts of the body to turn dark blue or even purple. This is known as Livor Mortis. But things are much more interesting in the muscles, where very strange things happen. The fact is that they don't stop working immediately after the body dies. Very complex biochemical processes take place there, which lead to gradual compaction and contraction of the muscles. Fists clench and the joints are fixed in place. This phenomenon is known as rigor mortis. Over time, of course, the muscle dies and the rigidity goes away. Then the corpse slowly cools down. After death, metabolic processes and heat production stop. The corpse begins to cool gradually. This is known as algor mortis, but it can also be the other way around. The body can heat up, for example, in a fire or outside if the temperature is plus 40 degrees. The body temperature, when it is no longer regulated by life processes, will tend to equal the temperature of the environment. That's just physics. There is also such a thing as mummification. Immediately after death, the skin begins to give up moisture. Liquid evaporates from the surface of the body. That's why a person loses weight after death, although only slightly. By the way, that's why there is a myth that hair and nails continue to grow after death. In fact, it is the skin around it that shrinks from the loss of moisture, and so it seems that the nails and hair have grown larger. And now you're about to see something shocking. The faint of heart should better watch other of Super Tony's videos. Whoa, no, Tony, you stay. After a person dies, millions of bacteria begin to thrive in their body. The immune system no longer works and they take over. The bacteria begin to multiply furiously and accelerate the destruction of all body tissues. This is the process of putrefaction, which is accompanied by the formation of very smelly substances and gases. They begin to accumulate in the tissues and organs, changing the appearance of the deceased. The facial skin swells. The head, neck, chest, abdomen, and limbs increase in volume. The skin becomes tight and sort of tense. It may crack, and blisters may form because of gases. Over time, of course, they come out. But imagine standing next to a dead body that makes different noises because of the gases coming out of all of the orifices. And because of the muscle contraction, it might even twitch. Yuck, scary. Because of all these processes, after a year, there is only a skeleton in the coffin. If for some reason the casket has to be opened, there may no longer be any smell. Then the tendons decay and mineralization occur, as a result of which, after three decades, a bunch of fragile bones, not bound in any way, is the only thing left of the person. By the way, some people think that we eat so many preservatives that corpses now rot at a much slower rate, but that's nonsense. Our bodies are not stupid, and all of our systems are designed to flush out all of the unnecessary stuff. Any ideas about preservation are just not realistic, because it doesn't obey the laws of biological chemistry. But the knowledge of what processes take place after death, how livor mortis and rigor mortis set in, at what speed the corpse cools down, how certain changes are formed, allow specially trained people to draw conclusions about what exactly caused death and when it happened. Does a shot in the head always result in instant death? Spoiler alert, no, it doesn't. There is still a chance of survival, and now I'll tell you everything in more detail. Doctors say that from a biological point of view, the trajectory of the bullet is very important. 
It turns out that the chance of surviving a shot in the head is much higher if the bullet entered through the forehead and exited from the back of the head than if it entered through one temple and exited from the other. The fact is that when the bullet enters through the forehead, it damages only one hemisphere of the brain, whereas in the second case, the bullet goes through both hemispheres. The human brain is a rather adaptive organ, which, like a twin-engine airplane, is able to readjust itself and work even if one engine is lost. Of course, its performance will be significantly reduced, but the chances of surviving in such a situation are much higher. In addition, it is very important where the bullet hit. For example, what part of the brain was damaged? The brain is probably the most complex organ in our body. It has many different parts, each responsible for different things. For example, the cerebellum is responsible for movement coordination. If it's damaged, you can survive, but you won't be able to walk or move the way you used to. Another example is the temporal lobe, which is our hard drive. This is where all the memories are stored, and if it is damaged, you might forget everything that happened to you before the injury. And there's also the occipital lobe. It's the visual center of the brain. If you've ever been hit hard in the back of the head, you may have seen stars floating in front of your eyes. This is just because there has been some minor damage to the visual centers of the brain. There are also centers of speech, thinking, perception, and many more different areas, each of which has its own purpose, which we won't mention in detail. However, we have to talk about the medulla oblongata, which is responsible for controlling breathing and heartbeat. Clearly, if this part of the brain is damaged, you'll have a hard time surviving. In addition, the brain has many large blood vessels that supply it with oxygen-enriched blood, and damage to these too can disrupt or stop the brain from functioning at all. By the way, from the point of view of physics, lethality also depends on the mass and velocity of the bullet fired. For example, a bullet from an AK-47 assault rifle has an extremely high velocity. Bullets fired from it are notorious for causing serious damage to brain regions as they pass through, compared to relatively slower pistol bullets. However, relatively slow and small bullets can sometimes do far more serious damage than fast ones. Small projectiles can penetrate the inside of the head, but then ricochet around in the skull and cause even more damage. By the way, a bullet inside the brain is a bigger threat than a bullet that went through and out the head. Overall, there are certain factors and actions that increase the chances of survival in case of a headshot. A person has a better chance of surviving if they don't stop breathing and their blood pressure remains high enough. These functions are necessary to maintain an adequate supply of oxygen to the brain, but the victim must be treated urgently to increase their chances of survival. Doctors must do everything possible to remove dead tissue and clear the area to relieve the inevitable swelling. Otherwise, it will have no outlet and will start to come out at the base, which often has fatal consequences. Sometimes doctors place strains to remove excess fluids and prevent dangerous brain swelling. According to statistics, the survival rate after a gunshot wound to the head is about 5%, but only 3% of survivors are able to restore normal functioning of the brain and the body. Which means Hollywood movies don't lie about people surviving headshots. But even if a person is lucky enough to survive, it is very unlikely that they will be able to live as before. Hello everyone! Ew! Tony, have you no shame? Although, you know, farting is normal. It even has a fancy scientific name, flatulence. But why are farts are sometimes odorless and sometimes stink of death? Why is it that sometimes we silently break wind, and other times the sound of a fart makes the windows rattle? Want to get to the bottom of this? Then let's go! The average person farts up to 10 times a day, and even your favorite celebrity or sex symbol produces half a liter of stinky farts per day. Farts travel at up to 7 miles an hour, and we have the answer to the question in your head. Yes, farts are flammable, all because of their chemical composition. Our intestinal gases are 59% nitrogen, 21% hydrogen, 9% carbon dioxide, 7 methane, 3 oxygen, and 1% hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and other stinky compounds. So where does the air in our intestines come from? It's very simple. We ingest it. When we eat or talk, air constantly enters the digestive system. Some of it comes out in the form of burps, while the rest goes on a long journey through the intestines. Once in the colon, 
This air mixes with the gases released by the bacteria inside us. And believe me, there are a lot of beneficial bacteria in there that helps us digest our food, but they release bad-smelling gases too. Moreover, there is a certain category of foods that contain carbohydrates that are difficult to digest. For example, cabbage or beans. These are the kinds of foods that bacteria really like. They feed on them like a hungry lion on an antelope making it easier for our bodies to digest them. But the more active our bacteria work, the more unpleasant smells they produce. Something similar happens when we eat too much or too quickly. Badly chewed chunks of food are also difficult to process, and more air enters the digestive tract than usual. Those who drink carbonated drinks also run the risk of becoming an outcast because of the constant gas attacks. Another cause of flatulence is intolerance to a particular substance. The most common example is lactose intolerance. Lactose is found in all dairy products. 6,000 years ago, this wasn't a problem because we only consumed milk as babies, and only babies produce lactase, an enzyme that breaks down lactose into simpler carbohydrates. If it doesn't break down, the lactose directly falls into the clutches of our bacteria, which feed on it, releasing a huge amount of stinky gases. Even now, in some nations, most of the population cannot consume dairy products. Basically, these are countries where such products have not become popular and they are not particularly consumed. For example, 85% of the population of China is lactose intolerant. Now, let's get back to our farts. Have you ever noticed that when a loud fart bursts out of your bowels, making you proud of yourself, there is usually no unpleasant smell? But silent farts make you cover your nose and flee to another country just to avoid being killed by that awful stench. It's all about the fart formation process. If you accidentally swallow a rather large air bubble, it passes very quickly through the entire digestive system, does not have time to absorb unpleasant gases, and flies out with a loud pop. Meanwhile, the air that flows slowly through the intestines absorbs gases from bacteria, then leaving your body slowly and silently, at the same time forcing everyone around you to look for that smelly fog machine. Although flatulence itself is perfectly normal, it can create many embarrassing situations. But if you eat healthy, you can easily avoid it. If you don't create the right conditions for smelly bacteria in your digestive system, then you can easily avoid being flatulent. Well, and taking care of your digestive health is always good. To finish, here is a list of foods that cause excessive gas. These are all legumes, corn, milk, garlic, beer, potatoes, onions, bread, cabbage, and eggs. So you can eat all that at the same time while camping to mess with the friend that is sleeping in the same tent as you. Hello everyone! So Tony, are you feeling sad? Would it cheer you up if I told you that you are really special? Mm. Friends, you are very special too by the way. For example, because you decided to watch our video and learn something new. But I want to tell you about some very rare features of your body, which are found only in a few percent of people on the planet. Watch carefully, maybe you are also one of these super people. Be sure to let us know in the comments. Let's go! I think you've all heard of a disease called osteoporosis. It is called by a single gene mutation and is accompanied by brittle bones. However, it turns out that there was another type of mutation in the same gene. It gives people super dense bones that are almost impossible to break. It also gives people skin that is less susceptible to aging. Next up is a mutation known as golden blood. Of course, it is not literally gold. However, it is a type of blood with a very rare peculiarity. It contains no RH antigens. It was first discovered in 1961 in an Australian Aboriginal woman, and currently only about 40 people are known to have this type of blood. Nine of them are donors, and incredibly valuable ones, because their blood is suitable for absolutely any person. It is because of this value and rarity that this blood is known as golden blood. The next feature is one you may have already seen. It is a tiny hole right next to the ear. It is known as parotid fistula. It forms during fetal development and is found in about 5% of people. It is a kind of atavism, a reminder that the distant ancestors of all living things once had gills, 
This opening is often genetically inherited and can be present in one or both ears. You may also have the following feature. This is the palmaris longus muscle. It is a legacy of our ancestors and is responsible for releasing the claws and enhancing the grip when jumping from tree to tree. It is very easy to check if you have it. Put your hand on a flat surface with the palm up, put your pinky and thumb together, and lift them slightly. If you see a tendon on the wrist, then you are the unique owner of palmaris longus. But if you didn't find it, do not worry, it is absolutely useless in modern life. Tony, pay attention, we're about to talk about a complicated concept. It's known as genetic chimerism. Ancient Greek myths describe a chimera as a creature with a lion's head, a goat's body, and a snake's tail. Of course, a person cannot be half animal, but they may well have two sets of DNA. For example, in the case of an embryo absorbing its twin during intrauterine growth, sometimes this is reflected in the person's appearance in the form of pigmentary mosaicism or multicolored eyes. But more often people have no idea that there are two different sets of genes in their body. Chimerism does not cause any particular concern, but can become a cause of family problems. There was a well-known case when a mother was about to have her children taken away way because the genetic analysis showed that she was not related to them. Fortunately, it turned out that the woman suffered from chimerism, so the actual mother of the children was her absorbed twin, whose DNA was present in her body. The next feature is known as short sleeper syndrome. Perhaps these people are luckier than everyone else on our list. They are able to recover twice as fast as most of us. Among such lucky people were Margaret Thatcher, Salvador Dali, Winston Churchill, Nikola Tesla, and other remarkable people. The reason for this peculiarity is a gene mutation. Researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, have concluded that people with this mutation can complete tasks in less time than others. In other words, they sleep much more efficiently than everyone else. But how they do it is not yet clear. Finally, let's do an experiment. Lock your hands together. Well, there's nothing complicated here. Now pay attention to the way you put your thumbs. They're probably crossed. Easy, easy, that's perfectly normal. What's interesting is that half of the people on the planet place their right thumb on top and half place their left thumb on top. But there is 1% of people who do not cross those fingers, but put them side by side. Tell us in the comments exactly how you put your thumbs and we will try to prove this theory. And if you have any other unique qualities, tell us about them too. We really wanna know. The most unusual will be featured in the next video. In the meantime, Tony and I are going to make a new extraordinary video for you. We have to try hard because our subscribers are the most unique people in the world. Bye bye.